All right, you guys, so this is Mr. Tim Conley. He's a close, dear friend of mine. And uh, I'm going to let you go through all of the different, because you're doing a bunch of stuff. So I'd like for you to share the types of work you're doing. And then, um, yeah, so, but I did want to say that he contributed a lot to the hip hop course that I am teaching you guys. So um, I was really, when I reached out to him, um, with this question about, you know, you, you're you learning all these things that you really should have already known by now, right? And just the, the it's triggering in some ways and like maybe it could cause a bit of anger. Where do, what do you put that anger? Like how do you channel that, all that good stuff? And because of what he's been doing, um, and I'll let him tell you everything he's been doing, when he offered to kind of talk with you guys around this topic, I was really grateful. So, um, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for, um, uh-oh, the light went out in here. Give me just one second, because I am, the power was out in part of the building, so I'm in my colleague's uh, office. Give me one second here, I'll be right back. Okay. All right, so, as you all may have heard, or people make fun of us folks in Los Angeles, when we have any kind of weather scenario, we don't know how to respond. The city doesn't know how to respond. You know, we get two days of rain and all of a sudden the, the whole city goes in panic because it doesn't rain often here. So, but we've had rain and snow in different areas. I think the professor was sharing that with you just a moment ago, but uh, nevertheless, um, I'm happy to be with you uh, this morning, and uh, I go by Professor T. That's what my students call me. That's what uh, the hip hop cats call me on the on the street. They call me Professor or Professor T. I kind of like that because it, it gave me a little uh, an artist name, even though I I definitely don't have uh, the uh, lyrical skills or DJing skills or dancing skills that or artistry skills with the aerosol cans. That many of the folks uh, that I've gotten to know uh, do. Um, so I teach uh, uh, Africana studies or Pan-African studies at Cal State University Northridge um, as a, a lecturer. And so this is my this, this is what I call my fun job because what I also do is I'm the department chair of cinema and film at a small school, Columbia Co Private uh, College, not uh, Columbia College Hollywood. It's a nonprofit private college here in uh, Los Angeles. And so that is my administrator capacity. So I run a film department there, but I, I come here and I, and I teach uh, ethnic studies, Africana studies, Pan-African studies here at Cal State University Northridge. And um, it's really a privilege because the students here, uh, like probably like many of you are, are just really engaged in diving into uh, the content and really heavy subjects that we cover such as the black male and the black female in contemporary times, uh, black popular culture. Uh, and my, my, my favorite class that I teach is the politics of hip hop culture. So that, that is also one um, that I'm teaching uh, this semester. So um, in addition to that, uh, my uh, scholarship as a um, practitioner, I'm a filmmaker. And so I actually have a film that just premiered at the Los Angeles Pan-African Film Festival titled Eve After Dark. And I'm a producer on that particular film. And that film covers the uh, rich history of some folks you've probably heard of and how they got started and many others that were DJs and uh, promoters at this teenage nightclub in Los Angeles slash Compton. Uh, this is pre-NWA and straight out of Compton. That's not the origins of the story of hip hop in LA. This is pre that time. Uh, at Eve After Dark, and it was like the safe space for uh, teens to go to in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, amongst all the challenges that were happening um, in the city of Los Angeles and Compton um, due to uh, racism, Jim Crow laws, uh, oppression, you name it. And so this was uh, an, an outlet of expression or just joy uh, for uh, a few nights 
uh, on the weekend that, that, that young people could go to. And, and, and in this place, they helped to establish what would be hip hop on the West Coast. So when we think of hip hop on the West Coast, people often start with the NWA story. But NWA is about mm, eight years, nine years down the road, maybe 10 years, if you want to argue um, taking it back into like the funk disco era that transitioned into hip hop. So um, that's really uh, the work that I do, just educating folks as a documentarian, as a filmmaker about uh, stories around uh, hip hop culture and the journey of hip hop beyond just the music business. And so it's really uh, been a joy and a treat uh, of mine to to do that. And if we have time, I'll try to see if I can pull up my trailer to the film so you all can check that out and and I will let your uh, professor know um, if we have some screenings a bit closer to you all there in, in the southeast um, so I will definitely let you know about that and we're uh, sort of in the uh, touring uh, college campuses and, and uh, film festivals right now with the with the film and so um, it was really a joy to, we had a great turnout at the Pan-African Film Festival so I was super excited about that but um, really, I, I'm, I'm here to talk to you all about just a, a few things. But um, before I do that, I just want to ask um, your professor, do, did you want to do more of a Q&A or did you want me to go in and just do, do, do my thing? I was going to show some slides. I, I just want to really make sure I'm being conscientious of the time. Yeah. Um, do you guys want a Q&A type situation or more of a lecture type situation? Which do you prefer? Or can we have a blend of both? We can, yeah. I'll see when they go around. I have a question. Yeah. So, yeah, they're saying they don't have questions right now. So, okay. like, if we could start with what you prepared, and then if there's time for questions, that would be great. Okay, sounds good. So, I'm going to share my screen here in just a moment. Um, and I just want to show quickly show a couple of slides here from one of my discussions that I have with my Black Male and Contemporary Times class, because these slides sort of really cover a lot of um, uh, what I like to center on. And so uh, for many of us, we have, let me see if I can move this thing down there. There we go. So for many of us, we have grown up in a world, in a society that has sort of promoted or told the narrative that uh, the Eurocentric perspective is the only perspective. It is the way of being. It is the way we learn. It is the way we operate. It is the way we educate. But what has been left out of the conversation is the different perspectives. And in this particular central focus, uh, I'm going to sort of uh, just reference Afrocentricity, uh, the epistemology that seeks to re-enter and relocate African Black uh, people, African people, Black Africans on the continent of Africa and people of Black African descent in the diaspora. Let me say that again. It is the epistemology that seeks to re-enter, relocate African people, Black Africans on the continent of Af Africa and people of Black African descent in the diaspora. And so when I was in school, I didn't have any of this information until probably I was going into my junior slash senior year in college. And I took at that time what they called a black studies course at the University of Oklahoma. And so that was the first time I had ever heard Afrocentricity. And I never understood why I saw so many of my black brothers and sisters wearing uh, uh, traditional types of African clothing, uh, because from what I was taught, you know, it was very negative. When they talked about the continent of Africa, they talked about Africa as if it was a small little country, not a continent, and not talking about the majesty and the expansiveness that is the African continent that has really shaped the entire world and not really telling the stories of how uh, the African continent has shaped the entire world. And so, uh, for me, uh, learning about, um, uh, I don't know why my screen is freezing here. There we go. Uh, learning about Afrocentricity was really important because I grew up in 
what, what we called at that time South Central LA. They call it South LA now. And I was there during the time of, of probably movies you may have heard of, such as Boys in the Hood or Menace to Society. And those were just glimpses into a bigger social economic problem that had was sort of uh, created and had been because of white supremacy and the stain of oppression and white supremacy. And so Afrocentricity is a method of healing by changing the focus onto self rather than those that are oppressed. And that's a really important key in this conversation. It's a method of healing again, by changing the focus onto self rather than those that are oppressed. So it is really uh, this, uh, this idea around this connection to your internal and external self. And that dives into um, the African worldview. It is an understanding of his or her relationship with social institutions, nature, objects, and other people and spirituality. And this is based on African cultural beliefs and practices and values. And see, in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, those who fed into white supremacy and the, the challenges with the colonists or colonizers, as they're often referred to, is they try to um, erase this. And the truth of the matter is, when these folks these enslavers went to the continent of Africa. They didn't just go and grab any Africans uh, that, that were there in the continent. I don't know why this light keeps turning off, but I think you all can still see me, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't know why uh, this light is doing this, but anyway. So the enslavers, they would go to the continent of Africa and they would specifically uh, seek and request African uh, from different uh, nations that had specific skill sets. These folks, they can uh, translate and scribe in Hebrew. These folks understand ancient uh, writing and ancient languages. They understand Aramaic. They understand uh, this language. They, so these folks were actually scholars and academics that were forced into uh, slave labor. And then you had these folks understand irrigation and farming. These folks understand this type of innovation and technology. Um, this was all understood by the enslavers. And these enslavers understood this um, so much so that th they were afraid. And the fear was by allowing them to uh, bring the majesty too far along in the uh, colonies uh, that they would uh, overpower, overtake, and overcome. So what is the first thing that they have to do? They have to create a new narrative. And here are the new narratives they create. We, let's create maps that draw the continent of Africa as a much smaller force than we see of what would be later known as the United States. Let's use language that uh, tells a, a story, an untrue story, of the Europeans as being the dominant group and the Africans as being these savages, these uh, individuals who are almost less than human that are, that are animalistic and barbaric. And let's create narratives around that and archetypes, which is where you get the Mammy, the Aunt Jemima, right? The Uncle Tom, the Coon, the Uncle Remus, all right? So on and so forth. And you get these ridiculous narratives and stereotypes that, uh, were perpetuated throughout chattel slavery in the Americas. And also, um, unfortunately and sadly, a film, Birth of a Nation in 1915. That's the first film ever shown in the White House by President, the racist bigot President Woodrow Wilson, who also ensured that after that film was really highlighted the Ku Klux Klan and their rise, that that film uh, would, would help to set the path for new operating Jim Crow laws post-1915 and the uh, excitement over the Ku Klux Klan and some of the things that were uh, instigated and narrated in that film, such as uh, lynching and cross burning. Um, I don't have pictures with me today. If you get a chance to check out the work of Dr. Joy DeGruy, post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, you can find some videos actually on YouTube. She talks about um, just the, the sickness that was created over uh, a couple hundred years, right? We're talking about a sickness where people leave church on a Sunday and go to a lynching party or a burning party. This was happening 
in, in the 1900s, right? We're not talking about the 1700s. We're talking about the 1900s. This is happening in the lifetime of my grandparents. This is happening in the lifetime of my mother. And we, we have smaller glimpses and instances of this still happening today, sadly. So these are, uh, are, are things that were created by these tragic narratives um, and the stain of white supremacy and oppression, right? And so uh, what I try to do and what many folks are trying to do as educators is to tell the truth about history, such as the 1619 Project. If you haven't heard about that, check that out. That work is awesome on the 1619 Project. And really tell the truth about what happened and tell the truth about who uh, uh, Black people really are and what is the majesty of the continent of Africa. So in understanding this African worldview um, is really understanding uh, what is known as an ontology. And in this ontology, you have spirituality, interdependence, holism, humanism, emotional vitality, rhythm, and oral tradition. And all of these are uh, interconnected. And the way that they are interconnected is from an, an Afrocentric perspective of learning and of telling history. History is not told from the way of the Eurocentric perspective where we write everything down and we read out of the text in the, in the way that we learn from the Eurocentric perspective, but it's really an interdependence of understanding uh, who and respecting, for example, whom our elders are or the oral griots, that's where we get the MC and, 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 the, and the majesty of that come from the storytellers, right? I'm sure your uh, professor may have or will be covering that soon. And just this understanding of who we are through our clothing, through our what we call dance, which is just another form of communication, or the, the music, which is another form of communication, right? Or nature, or our religion, or, or animals, the spirit world, all of these things matter in, in, in the African worldview and ancient African civilization. And it mattered so much that it was a part of your whole being. So when they, uh, the, the colonizers, the enslavers brought uh, African nations of citizens who and just sort of meshed everyone together, the one thing they had in common was this ontology uh, and these seven primary characteristics. And even though they spoke different languages, had certain cultural cues and norms, this brought everyone together and created that magic that became the black community. And there's a reason why the Black community has felt so strongly around basing everything around the, the Black church. Now, the Black church takes us into chattel slavery. It was the two or three hours on a Sunday that the enslavers would allow those who were enslaved to have a space of freedom and a space of peace. And it really wasn't for a space of freedom and peace. What it really was was to try to justify the behavior of the barbaric treatment. But what they didn't know is that these individuals in these churches were creating something that was going to continue the majesty of the continent of Africa because of what you can't just strip things from them and it goes away. That's a Eurocentric perspective because it was within them. So um, a, a good example of that. Have any of you seen the movie or the two movies now, the Black Panther movies? Yes. Okay. So if you've seen the movies and the inside of the gum line is a coating, that coating tells that they are a citizen of Wakanda, right? So I love that sort of uh, uh, artistic uh, idea there because I feel based on the research that we all have that coating within us. That's why you start to feel a certain connection to certain things that are very Afrocentric. So when we hear certain types of music, especially music with drum beats and sounds, at the, the, the basic sort of uh, uh, anchoring of, of the continent is, is the sound, is the beat, is the movement, is the motion. And in that is a very sophisticated communication that does not require uh, words, oral communication in the way we communicate. It's such a sophisticated communication that when the enslaved were brought over in the transatlantic slave trade, they were communicating and making these sounds first with uh, the, either the drums they created or whatever they were able to bring over or making the sounds on the trees. That sound that they were making 
there's an ancient word and term for that sound, the, the sound that they were making, which was really just communication, uh, and the rhythm, the communication. Does anyone in here know what that term is, that ancient African civilization term? No. Rapid. Rapping. Rapping is an ancient African civilization term. It is a term for communication, and it does not even necessarily require words. It, it is the the beat, the rhythm, as we as we call it, but really it's just communication that's connected to that ontology of these characteristics. And that was what was so special about the the enslaved that they figured out ways to still communicate regardless of the oppression and the horrors of chattel slavery uh, in America. They communicated so well that over time they created uh, what we call song, but they were really uh, uh, well devised and planned songs or what we call uh, field songs, corn ditties, Negro spirituals, right? So in order to get through the day's work, this required a rhythm and a syncopation, a syncopation that helped them to have the uh, wherewithal to not only pass on the communication, but to get the work done as the enslavers were around them and watching them. They just thought that they were singing. But what they were really doing was communicating about ways to revolt, ways to escape, ways to get through the horrors of the day. So when you would hear songs like Roll, Jordan, Roll, uh, they're, talk, they're, they're not talking about the Jordan River. They're talking about going north in the Ohio River. And the Ohio River, past the Ohio River, was the way to go north. But they used this code of language in order to, and I'm speaking of North America now, in order to communicate to each other a, a coded map on how to uh, sort of move out of the tragedy of chattel slavery in America. And so these, that's just an example of this interdependence, this, this co collected understanding. And the pass down of history was also done through this, the stories and the songs and the types of clothing that were worn. So uh, just to, to go back to the movie, the original uh, Black Panther, not the one that just came out, if you see the different types of clothing, you're seeing different types of clothing throughout the continent of Africa. And the uh, costume designer uh, made sure that they had the different types of clothing because that is so important when we talk about Afrocentrism. It tells the story of where you're from as well in, 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 your, in terms of your clothing. And there's much more to this that I, I won't necessarily get into today, but I really wanted to paint this picture because if we're gonna talk about hip hop, if we're gonna talk about uh, the politics of hip hop culture, uh, it is always important to understand what happened and where we came from and really how did we survive? Because slavery was vicious and it was ruthless and it was uh, a mechanism that uh, you wanna talk about millions of folks that were killed during chattel slavery how many, let me ask this, this class, maybe you've read something, how many lives were lost of folks from different African nations during the transatlantic slave trade? Does anyone have an idea? I can't believe you. Talk about millions. How many millions do we think? Um, I would say two million. Okay, so the the... The current history books and those who are who are sort of documenting this say around four to six million, right? But those who dig, dig deeper and really dive into this will tell you that it's probably closer to 50 to 60 million lives that were lost. 50 to 60 million lives. And I'm gonna tell you what happened. On these voyages when these enslavers had um, raiders go in, they didn't go in themselves deep into the continent. They had raiders go in, say they went east and they went into uh, uh, nations such as what we call now Kenya or, or a nation like that. They would bring out individuals and go for hundreds of miles chained with heavy chains and other devices to control them and have them walking in an assembly line. 
They would go for hundreds of miles. And let's say one of the enslaved broke an ankle or hurt their knee or something else happened where they were no longer what they the enslavers would call fit. They would unchain them, they would unlock them, and they would leave them in places uh, injured with no food, no water, no way to get back to where they came from. And they became then the prey of the animals that were there. So that happened a lot. In addition to that, when you're on these uh, slavers, enslavers ships and the, the bows of the ship, which is basically, you can call it like a ship basement or an undercarriage. They were living in fecal matter. They were living in uh, vomit. They were living in disease and their food was amongst that. They would just throw it in there. So they're eating their food amongst all of that and all of that being having to be ingested. So that was another issue. So mi millions of enslaved died that way. Another issue that took place is many of the folks decided they did not want to die in bondage and they found ways to jump off of the ships in shark infested waters. And after a while, those sharks were very smart. They knew when those ships were around that there was going to be food. So we're talking about 50 to 60 million. So that's that. Then to come here, if it is if it is felt that you were unfit in any way, um, you could lose limbs, you could be castrated, you could be hung, you could be burned, you could be whipped or beat into death. So it is amazing, and I'm sharing these tragic these tragic uh, examples to share that it is amazing that people of African descent, Black people, African Americans, and others are still here today and surviving through this, and that just tells you about the. Uh, the power of those and the power of that continent of those who come from the continent, the continent of Africa, the continent whose history is thousands of years old with, with strong nations and powerful people. So let me close on this part of, of, of this uh, part of our time together with just saying this. In, within the continent of Africa, you had powerful nations of people who were living in advanced civilization, not understood totally by the Europeans. And also they tell a different narrative. They tell a narrative of savage and beastly behavior, which is the narrative they had to justify for what they did. Um, and it's a horrible one. But the, the truth of the continent of Africa is this, advanced civilization, advanced, advanced nations, advanced communication, advanced uh, ways of understanding how the world operates and how to connect to, for them, the, the, the spiritual realm. So an advanced civilization across the many nations uh, in the continent of Africa. And to put this in perspective, let me ask you all this. How many, uh, if you were to put the United States as a uh, country inside the continent of Africa, how many times could you do it? If you were just to fit the entire and just move it on top of the continent of Africa, how many times could you do it? How many times could it fit inside the continent? Four, four, two, three, two, three. Ten times? Four times. About four times. Okay. To give you an idea of how large that continent is, so you could fit the, the uh, United States inside the continent. You could fit pretty much all of Asia inside the continent. And you could probably put uh, a few other countries uh, inside the continent, just, just to give you an idea of how wrong our maps are. The continent is huge. If you could go to outer space or find a correct map, um, you could probably Google it and find it. You, you would see, uh, uh, just get an example. And if you were in space, you could really see the scale of just how massive this continent is. And let's talk about uh, one last thing on, when we're talking about continents here. So they decided to give Europe the uh, designation as a continent. But does anyone know the key definition of continent, uh, what that is for that for for uh, countries to be considered a continent? Does anyone know what that key designation is? Doesn't it have to have like water? On enclosed water, enclosed water. Yeah, like the water on the. It has to be 
surrounded by ocean or something like that? So the key definition, and you're right, uh, the ocean, large land mass surrounded by the ocean or large or the water, the water, large land mass. So I want you to go and look at your maps and tell me where there's a large land mass surrounded by water that's the European continent. Look at the other continents and then look at the European continent and tell me where there's a large land mass surrounded by water. See, this is what I'm talking about, his story. And I say his, not her story, his story, because this was written by uh, prejudicial uh, white males who were colonizers, who bought into this false narrative about a manifest destiny. And a manifest destiny is, it is for the Europeans from their different uh, countries to go and conquer and to and to correct what is wrong in nations and lands. Uh, and we, we know the atrocities, or at least we're learning about the atrocities of what happened here in North America. So it is important to understand that to connect to uh, more of uh, brothers and sisters to our Afrocentrism. And the reason for that is you will find that you are already, it's already embedded in your DNA. Your ancestors are already there and all of this is a part of your being. And the more you connect and the more you dive deeper into your Afrocentrism, you will see how all of these things are connected. How did we get to blues, blues music? How did we get to jazz? How did we get to rock and roll? Which was the, the term rock and roll was what they were calling this new sound that came out of blues and jazz, this new sound uh, that, that was sort of changing chords on a guitar or the drum sound or the, the way they played the piano. Rock and roll was a term uh, in, in, the, in the black neighborhood for, for uh, getting it on, or sex, as they would say. So you would, you'd hear uh, the toasters of that time. Those are, the, this is pre-MC. Toasters was a, a street poetry. They would, they would use language like looking good, looking fine. We about to rock and roll on mine, right? That was toasted and that's pre MC. And so toasters would use this language. And then these white DJs who were hearing this new music from the likes of, for example, a Fats Domino or Chuck Berry or Lil Richard. Um, and by the way, Elvis is not the king of rock and roll. Don't believe that. that <laughs> I, the raggedy movie came out about Elvis. I won't watch it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an Elvis hater. Elvis is no king of rock and roll. Everything he got, he stole from folks in the black community. So that's a whole nother conversation. Anyway, but that's, that's not, what's that? I agree. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So this idea of rock and roll and blues and, and, and jazz all comes from ancient African civilization, the oral griot tradition, right? And then we move into uh, new sounds, funk and uh, new sounds and disco, and then we get into uh, the this culture that brewed in the early 1970s, late 1960s, and made its way and really sort of started to blossom as we, by the time we get to 1980, known as hip hop. And it wasn't called hip hop back then. By the way, the terms hip and hop came from toasters. Toasters, again, they use this street poetry. Boy, that show was a, was a nice hop we went to. Boy, you looking really hip. And so they took those terms, hip and hop. Don't you let any of those other folks try to say that they created hip hop. That came from toasters in the 1950s and 60s who were going, leaving the South and going to cities like Los Angeles and New York and Detroit and places like that, for example, Chicago. And they they had this toasting language, right? That was from uh, uh, really the older Black men of the South created that, that, that toasting language. There's a different type of toasting that we see in uh, Jamaica, uh, uh, through the patois, but the toasting that I'm talking about is um, um, here. Uh, so both of those sort of help the, the, the language, but really this idea of toasting uh, comes from the oral griots, right? It's, it's a really a poetic way of, of telling stories, right? That's attached to the sounds that we hear. So um, I've shared a whole lot about the African worldview um, but I, I just wanted to sort of paint that perspective and tell all of you this, you matter, you come from powerful wealth of nations and people, you come from majesty, and you are all noble. Um, one of the greatest divine teachers I ever heard said, noble, I created thee, why dost thou abase thyself? Don't believe the hype. 
right? That's what Flavor Flav said in Public Enemy. Don't believe the hype of narratives that were created from a racist system, from Jim Crow, from white supremacy, from oppression, because those lies they're trying to still inhabit today. And hip hop's hip hop's true message, not the music industry and some of the debacles, but hip hop's true message was to bring the community together. Or as Chuck D from Public Enemy said, it is the CNN, the message of the streets for the youth populations and those who are, are still considering them youthful, even though I'm not uh, a part of the, the youth <laughs> population anymore. So my, my point is, um, it, it, hip hop was there to create uh, UMA, to create unity, right? It, it, it was there to bring people together to, to create artistic expression, which is really just part of that African ontology that I sort of painted uh, in just a few minutes. But um, I know we are short on time. I, I want to just pause for a moment. Do we, are there any questions on anything that I, I've shared so far or really any questions about hip hop? Because we can dive, dive deep for the time we have left. Questions? It's not really about hip hop, it's really just my personal opinion. So, and then it's also something that I'm just inquiring about. What's the difference between Afrocentricity and Black Extraordinary? Can, can, I couldn't totally hear that. Can you repeat? Uh... I said, what's the difference between Afrocentricity and Black nationalism? What's the difference between um, Afrocentricity and Black nationalism? Great question. Um, the, the, the main difference that I would say, um, and, and really they're connected, right? Black nationalism is, collect, is connected to Afrocentricity, but Afrocentricity focuses more on this internal quest and voyage for connecting yourself to ancient African civilization and understanding and learning about uh, as much as you can about your heritage and your roots and really understanding uh, how you're connected to the majesty in terms of what we uh, as uh, African nations were really doing uh, throughout history and how we we're, we're connecting. So that just those slides that I was just showing, um, I, I would say uh, the other movement is more towards uh, some of that, but also towards uh, the, the, the quest and, and, and the fight for fighting the power for justice. So they both are intertwined and combined, but one is more of a uh, an activism route and the other is is, is diving deep into just this holistic healing. That's That would probably be my, my main sort of uh, connected to the two, but also a, a, some small distinct separations. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. You did, thank you. Other questions? Thoughts? I heard you guys dive deep in here. Do you have any questions about the stuff you're diving deep on as it relates to perhaps hip hop? Uh, I'll just talk real quick about, um, I think uh, you kind of highlighted how during the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade that it kind of started on the African continent. And I think uh, us, and I might just be speaking for myself, but I often think about how many people died on the ship on the way here and the conditions here. But I, I don't really I think it was cool for you to highlight like they were walking in shackles for miles in Africa before they left. And I don't really think we all all the way think through like, you know, that they were at, I can't imagine sleeping on the floor. I definitely can't imagine sleeping on top of somebody else. And I definitely can't imagine sleeping on top of somebody else with like food everywhere, poop everywhere, vomit everywhere. So I think it's for you to highlight the specifics of exactly what they were going through since they were starting to be taken from Africa it was really cool. Yeah, it is really deep. And one of the things I didn't touch on and I'll just share real quick for that it, it, it just burns in my stomach when I even think about it, is if you get to a chance, and if I don't know how many of them are still around, but if you can get a chance to go on to the, uh, some of the uh, slaveholding uh, places, in slaveholding places um, in, in West Africa, on, on the shores of uh, 
some of the countries there, you will see um, <clears throat> you will see quarters. So you'll be able to go into like the dungeness places that they were keeping the enslaved, but you will see passages sometimes that lead up to another place. And that other place they would lead up to would be the governor's private room or the enslaver's private room. And what was happening in there is they were just picking and choosing any uh, enslaved African woman and they would bring her up there, clean her up, and they would just rape her and bring her back down. And this happened over and over again. And the same thing kind of happened when the enslaved were, bought, were brought to the Americas. The, 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 these souls, these humans, these beautiful people were considered property. And they created narratives and language to say that they were less than human. So much so that the Europeans really believed that. Do you know in, in the early zoos and early circus shows, they would have um, folks chained up and that the Europeans were looking around to see if they had, if, if the African citizens had tails. If they had tails, the African descendants had tails. These are the, this is the sickness that was going on during that time period that still is a part of some of the framework of today that we're, we're trying to combat. And so it was a, a very harsh and rough place. And imagine this, your, your loved spouse is now being taken to be raped. What is that doing psychologically to you as a, a, a man or to your family for your children to be dealing with that? Okay. This was viciously done. And the psychological damage is hundreds of years deep. This is why I say it is amazing that we are here still surviving and in some respects thriving in any way. This, that goes to tell you how powerful, how powerful stuff you come from. All of you in that room, myself included, how powerful we come from. I think of my mother who was a student in the late 1960s at the University of Southern California in classes with all white men. And she's the only, not only black student, but a black female in the classes. The visceral hatred that she dealt with but found a way to still survive. That comes from her, her connections to the motherland. That comes from her connections to her roots, whether she knew this or not. We all come from some strong stuff. That's why I say noble, we were created to be. So, and I want us to, and I tell students this all the time, believe in your, no, in your nobility. You come from powerful stuff. And regardless of what the European uh, ideals have said, it's a lie. Because if we really want to go deep, and I don't have time to do that today, the civilization, many scientists argue, starts in the cradle of Africa. We can talk about um, these, all of these nations of all of these other folks and how they changed over time, but they're really African. That's a whole nother conversation. We won't go there today. But um, we come from some powerful stuff. I think we have a, a few minutes left. Any other questions, thoughts, or ideas? Well, let me do this. Um, I want to just do this and and I will share my um, trailer to my film. Your professor can show it to you another time, but let me just do this for just a couple of minutes. I, I wanna pose something to you that I call uh, mindfulness training and thinking. And this is what I want students to do is, uh, in their time uh, in, in, in the institution as well as outside, right? I want you to think about this. When you wake up in the morning, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you all to do this. When you wake up in the morning, outside of maybe going to the restroom, you should take a moment to sit down. Take a moment to center yourself. Close your eyes. Take some deep breaths in the nose, out the mouth. And as you're doing that, I want you to start to concentrate and think about a place of joy and a place of happiness for you. What brings you peace? And imagine you're in that space. And hold on to that for a couple minutes. And after you get to a couple minutes, then I want you to begin to think about what you are grateful for. And 
If negative thoughts come in, just brush them to the side and start thinking about all the things you're grateful for. Run a list of what you're grateful for. And after you finish that list of what you're grateful for, think about what you can start doing to seize the day and to keep yourself at peace and to keep yourself at joy. Even if you have something chaotic going on, how do you not allow that to take your joy, to take your splendor, to take your peace? The more you start to do that, what you're building inside of your being that ties back to ancient African civilization is you are centering yourself. You are centering yourself around the world around you, right? That interdependence. And the more you start to do that, you build something called muscle memory. Muscle memory is when the brain can start triggering this on autopilot. And the more autopilot that you sort of engage, invoke, and create will uh, help to bring uh, certain levels of peace, even when you're dealing with tough subjects. You'll start to feel that churning going on, start concentrating on your peace, what brings you happiness, what brings you joy. And as many times as you can, when you're encountering things that I call, uh, I, I was about to cuss. I'm sorry, Professor. I almost said I'm, I'm about to cuss, but I'm like, what Steve Harvey say? I'm a, uh, I'm an entry level religious person. I don't, I, 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 I like cussing. That's my, my thing. But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, uh, but as you center yourself and things are happening around you, or you're starting to feel some type of emotion about something, as you center yourself, what you're really doing is you're connecting to your ancestry. You're connecting to what's in your DNA. <laughs> That's Afrocentrism. It is digging within and helping to bring the healing forward. And this is just a simple exercise. There's many more, but start your day that way. Now, to close your day, I suggest you do the same thing. Find that inner peace. Think about the things that bring you peace. Turn off social media. You know, it, I know it might be hard for some folks. I don't know about folks in this room, but turning off TikTok and Instagram Reels and Twitter and all these other things that are distractions. And just focus on, on you. And the last thing I'll say, one thing I also do is I look in the mirror and I say, I'm proud of you. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you for allowing me to be proud of myself. Thank you for allowing me to heal. Thank you for allowing me to look, to be of love. Thank you for allowing me against all odds to do this. We come from some strong stuff. But we've got to do this individually before we can do it collectively as a community. And that's where it starts. If we want to change, we have to change from within and connect to our roots. So that's what I have to, to share for today. I know we are just about at time. Professor, I'll turn it back over to you. If there's any other questions, maybe I could take one or two. I think we have a couple minutes here. Any other questions, y'all? Comments? Well, me personally, you know, learning about our history, I get so angry and I need to focus on that anger and just channel that into learning more. And I'm working on that. Because I just get so angry just knowing that happened, you know, to our ancestors and, and it's still going on. So I just learn more. Take that energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I just encourage you to learn about how hip hop can be a part of that, that communication to change the narrative in communities. Hip hop is social activism. Hip hop is communication hip hop is is really just the latest form of the african worldview that's what hip hop is not the music business hip hop culture it's a very there's a music business and there's hip hop culture they're two two very different things and so as you feel angry as you feel just mad about how why all this was allowed to happen why is this continuing to happen why are we seeing guerrilla policing tactics or other types of oppression happening. As you're learning about this or as you're experiencing this, I just want, I just really want to encourage you and other students in here to dive back into centering yourself around where you come from in that African worldview, bringing yourself into connection. Because if you were to go into like a black nationalist ideal or to go into some other type or Black Lives Matter, whatever it is, that really starts with that base and that anchor of the African worldview, that ontology that's within you. 
just like the Black Panther movie, you have it within you, you know, and know that you come from powerful stuff. And no matter what anybody says, don't buy into it. Just like Florida and all some of these other uh, crazy folks trying to stop AP African American history or the 1619 Project or critical race theory. There's a reason why, because they know that their truth is ugly and it's a lie. So don't buy into that. We will continue to fight. So fight with me, students, and heal yourselves and believe in yourselves and love yourselves. Maybe you're already doing it, but I just want to encourage you. Know that I love you. We, we come from the same beautiful crop of people in, in, in ancient African civilization. Call on your ancestors. Ask the ancestry to be with you, right? Ask the ancestors to be with you. Call, call out the folks that, are, that you know their names and ask them to be with you. We are all connected. It's deep. It's deep. Uh, I don't have time to go there today, but it is deep. So thank you for your time. Um, and, I, and I wish you well in this class. And, and, and I will connect with your professor I'm, I'm, if, if there's another time. And if she would like me to chime in, I'm happy to do that, too. And we can talk about uh, another subject. But if not, I, I wish you all well um, in your journey and your time uh, within the course and, and your studies there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, brother. Peace we'll be in you all. Stay yeah. encouraged. Bye bye. Uh -huh.